day 81 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. I don't know if you saw the news, if you saw the shorts or the reels on Instagram, but we did it last night. We hit 100,000 people in this community, meaning 100,000 Bible study friends. How did we all get so lucky to be able to be blessed with so many friends? And I am just so excited to see what God is going to continue to do in the lives of every person here. I am praying that it will only continue to bring Him glory and to bring people closer to Him in relationship, and that we will all grow to be disciple makers, because that's what we've all been called to do. That is the Great Commission. So thank you for being a part of this and for bringing people into the kingdom of God and for just making it a safe place for us to be able to come together as a family, to be able to encourage one another, to sharpen each other, and to love Jesus together. So with all of that said, tomorrow begins our prep day for our Holy Week. So if you have not done so, please make sure that you download our nine-day devotional. You can find that at heartdive.org slash Easter. It's our free gift to you. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to. Nobody's forcing you to. Same thing. If you don't want to celebrate Easter, you don't have to. Nobody's going to judge you for it. But collectively as a church, we just come together in unity to celebrate the death, the resurrection of Jesus and what He has done for us. And I think that that brings joy to the Father's heart as we remember Him collectively. So before we begin, if you could please help us out by hitting that like button, making sure you're subscribed, you've got that notification bell on. If you want to check out the Facebook group, you can continue conversations there. And if you have any questions about this Bible study, make sure to head on over to our website, heartdive.org, or check check out the description box. Lots of information, lots of links down there for you to be able to access. Otherwise, let's pray and jump into it. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this community. Thank you for the 100,000 people that have faithfully hit that subscribe button to say, we want to know you more, Jesus. That's why we're here. And in the grand scheme of things, 100,000 really isn't that much, Lord. We are just a small, tiny, tiny part of what you are trying to do in the world. But Lord, we are excited because that is just a little love note from you, a little benchmark to say, you know what? You guys are on the right track. You are growing the kingdom. And that's all we really need to know. But it's still exciting to know, Lord, that people are hungry for your word and for your presence. And so I pray that we stay focused on that and that we will all rise up to do our part to be able to bring others, Lord, into that same place, not necessarily in this Bible study, but at least in your presence, speaking to other people about who you are, Lord, inviting them to church, whatever it is that we need to do to be able to to grow them in their faith as well. So will you show us, Lord, who those people are that we are to extend that to, what it is that we are to say? Give us the confidence, Lord, but I just pray that we will not be overbearing in any way. I pray that we won't be judgmental in any way, but we will simply do it in love and grace the way that you did Jesus. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. I ask that you help us to forgive others. Will you just have your way in this Bible study today? We love you so much. We thank you for this time together and for every single Bible study friend here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we left off yesterday with the declaration that Moses would be writing a song and it was like a to be continued, dot, dot, dot. Well, today we get to hear that song. We get to hear the melody of his heart being expressed here in chapter 32. Reading from the ESV by Crossway translation, verse one, give ear, O heavens, and I will speak and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew like gentle rain upon the tender grass and like showers upon the herb. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. And yesterday, whenever I read this, I finally had this aha moment because my entire life, I had been looking for the significance in my name, Kanoilani, which means heavenly mist in the Hawaiian language. And in the Hawaiian culture, it is traditional that the grandparents are the ones who give the name to their grandchildren. And what I had been told is that it had been misting that night, and that is why she named me Heavenly Mist. So my whole life, I was always looking for significance in rain or a mist, and I couldn't quite put my finger on what that meant for me. Now, my grandmother was a believer. I finally realized that this name was divinely inspired when I read this scripture last night. And it all makes sense now for the many times that people have prophesied that I would speak. And it says, give ear, O heavens, and I will speak and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop as the rain, my speech 
as the dew, like gentle rain or a heavenly mist upon the tender grass and like showers upon the herb. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord and ascribe greatness to our God. And I know that I'm no Moses, but if you allow your heart to be open to those moments and for the Spirit to just speak these sweet messages to your heart, He will. And I just thought that was so cool. You know, Jesus will do that sometimes. He will just drop some love notes on you. And so, I hope that that happens for you. (laughs) Sorry, I didn't want to get emotional about this. And Okay, continue on. Verse four, the rock, his work is perfect. So we're not talking about Dwayne Johnson over here. We're talking about God Almighty, the rock, Jesus, our solid rock, the rock of ages. So Moses is declaring who God is and what he does here. For all his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. They have dealt corruptly with him though. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and a twisted generation. So declaring God as the rock here to saying he is secure, he is unchangeable, he is immovable. And they too could have been secure and immovable, yet they went away from him almost making this grotesque mockery of God. Verse six, do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? Remember the days of old. And what would that do? Well, if you remember God's faithfulness, the hope is that you will return to him knowing that he will rescue you. He will deliver you. He will restore you. He will redeem you. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he'll show you your elders and they'll tell Tell you, when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. So this whole time we've been reading about the fact that God is giving them the inheritance, that he's giving them their portion. But here it's saying, no, the Lord's portion is his people. They are his portion as well. So it's a two way street here. And he still feels the same way about us. I mean, that's why he gave up his own life. I mean, that's how much he values us. Verse 10, he found him in a desert land. Of course, a desert land being dry and thirsty, probably the same way that he found us when we were thirsting for something we didn't know what. And in the howling waste of the wilderness, he encircled him and he cared for him and he kept him as the apple of his eye. So it's almost as if God was looking down upon us and he can see us in that dry, unloved, rejected, stinky place of life. And he was like, you know what? I'm going to swoop down there and I'm going to pick them up. And it happened so fast because if it says that he kept him as the apple of his eye, well, this is speaking of the pupil of the eye. Now, I know that we have all grown up hearing that term and saying, oh, that means that they are loved. And it does. That's what it translates to. Like you are the favored one. But it comes from the fact that we're speaking of the pupil of the eye and the way that the eye is the fastest reflex in our human body and it will shut itself off to anything that is coming at it. And this happens in like one one thousandth of a second. And that's the way that God will respond to his people in need or whenever there is a threat. Verse 11, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. Now, I know I've mentioned it before, but I have seen in commentaries and also preached from the pulpits, these stories about the mama eagles who will kind of push their babies out of the nest so that they kind of stumble down and then the eagle will come and swoop them back up and take them back up to the nest and they will keep doing this over and over until one day the baby takes flight. Sounded like an amazing, inspiring story. But come to find out, it's pretty much folktale. I mean, if you look up scientifically how eagles learn how to fly, there's nothing, at least as far as I could find, and I was searching pretty deeply today, that that actually happens. They learn how to fly like any other bird learns how to fly. But then I thought to myself, well, you know what? What's to say that that didn't happen back then? Maybe that was the meaning that was passed down orally generation to generation. Because, I mean, we got talking donkeys in the Bible. Why not have eagles who are pushing their babies out of the nest? So I'm going with that. I'm going to keep that picture in my mind because I feel that way. I feel like all the time I'm being pushed out of the nest and tumbling down and out of control and somehow the Lord swoops in and he picks me back up and he puts me back in the nest. Half the time it doesn't make sense. Half the time it's unnatural. And so I'm keeping that in my heart because... Even if he doesn't physically do that, he does in my spirit. So we're rolling. Verse 12, the Lord alone guided him. No foreign God was with him. Even though they probably thought the foreign gods were with him, it was God alone. He made him ride on the high places of the land and he ate the produce of the field and he suckled him with honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. Now, if you know anything about honey and 
olive trees, apparently they will put their roots down among the rocks. And so spiritually speaking, whenever we are in between those crags, those hard places, between a rock and a hard place, we will be able to find the honey, the sweetness, the healing in the rock, but also that sustenance of the oil, the anointing, the presence of the Holy Spirit, if we have our roots dug down. Curds from the herd and milk from the flock with fat of lamb rams of Bashan and goats with the very finest of wheat, and you drank foaming wine made from the blood of the grape. So this is speaking of the fact that the Lord has blessed Israel above any other nation. He's given them abundance. He is giving them that sustenance. He's giving them this fertile land, a land flowing with milk and honey. But watch what happens in verse 15. But Jeshurun, which by the way, this is another name for Israel. It literally means upright one. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, stout, and sleek. Then he forsook God, who made him and scoffed at the rock of his salvation. They stirred him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods that they had never known. So again, anything in idolatry has its root in a demonic power, and so that's why it's saying they sacrificed to demons. To new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. You were unmindful of the rock that bore you, and you forgot the God who gave you birth. Now, as parents, our hearts want to be the same way. You know, we want to give our children whatever they want, because whenever you love someone, it's natural to want to give them the world. And the Lord feels the same way about us. He wants to give us our heart's desires. He wants to be able to fatten us up. Yet most of us know that even though anything is permissible, it isn't always beneficial. So as much as we too would like to take our kids to the candy store, let them pick anything they want every single day, we know that that is not the best thing for them because they would get cavities, they would probably become overweight and sick and bratty, and they would be on this emotional roller coaster when the peaks and crashes of blood sugar hit. And think about when you go to a buffet, you know, or you eat until you're really full. I mean, the last thing that you want to do is go run a marathon. Instead, we want a wheelchair to take us straight to our bed so we can just sleep off the lethargy. And the Bible even talks about this in Proverbs when it says, if you have found honey, eat only enough for you, lest you have your fill and then you vomit. So basically, too much of a good thing can actually be harmful, which is what the Lord is declaring here. He has blessed Israel with all of that fatness, and now they have completely forgotten him. So heart check, what leads more to forgetting God in your life, problems or prosperity? And what can we do to prevent this? And here's a big fat hint. I mean, it's pretty impossible to forget God whenever you are in the word every single day. So I think we're on the right road of preventing forgetting God. Verse 19, the Lord saw it and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be for they are a perverse nation, children in whom is no faithfulness. Now at face value, you will think that God hiding his face from you is cruel. However, this is actually an act of mercy and kindness if you look at it this way. Whenever God hides his face, and if you're living in sin, at first it's gonna be kind of a relief if God removes that presence because guess what happens? The conviction goes away. You suddenly stop feeling guilty and now you're free to continue in your sin and you're not going to feel bad about it. But the purpose is that the darkness will eventually set in and the hope is that they will then turn back to the kindness of God because they won't want to be in that place any longer. So God isn't doing it to be cruel. He is doing it so that they will come back to him. They have made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are no people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Now, who's the foolish nation? Well, Paul actually refers to this verse later on, I believe in Romans chapter 10, where he is saying that because Israel is not going to turn and be faithful to the Lord, he is going to use that foolish nation of the Gentiles. That's us. We've become the bride of Christ because they weren't willing to keep covenant with him. Verse 22, for a fire is kindled by my anger and it burns to the depths of Sheol, devours the earth and its increase and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. 
So in other words, nothing is out of the reach of God and his wrath and his anger. And I will heap disasters upon them. I will spend my arrows on them. Now, these are arrows of correction. Again, if you aren't willing to listen once he removes his presence from you, now he might actually have to stick a little arrow in your behind. So you're going to be like, where did that come from? I didn't like that. I'm going to head back to the place of safety. They shall be wasted with hunger and devoured by plague and poisonous pestilence. I will send the teeth of beasts against them with the venom of things that crawl in the dust. Outdoors the sword shall be reeve and indoors terror for young man and woman alike, the nursing child with the man of gray hairs. I would have said, I will cut them to pieces. I will wipe them from human memory. Had I not feared provocation by the enemy, lest their adversaries should misunderstand, lest they should say, our hand is triumphant. It was not the Lord who did all this. So since when does the Lord care about what the enemies of Israel think? Well, it's not that he cares about what they think of him the way that we care about what people think of us. He cares about his reputation because he is worried that they're going to say, ah, we are victorious over them. We did this. He's like, no, 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 no. I did this. Verse 28, for they are a nation void of counsel and there is no understanding in them. If they were wise, they would understand this. They would discern their latter end. So in other words, they're not considering the consequences of their actions here. How could one have chased a thousand and two have put 10,000 to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had given them up for their rock is not as our rock. Our enemies are by themselves. So this is speaking of that defeat by the enemy for their vine comes from the vine of Sodom and from the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of poison. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of serpents and their cruel venom of asps. So in other words, they are going to be under severe, inescapable judgment. Verse 34, is not this laid up in store with me, sealed up in my treasuries? Vengeance is mine and recompense for the time when their foot shall slip. For the day of their calamity is at hand and their doom comes swiftly. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. So here we're seeing a flipping of the script a little bit where he is saying, but you know what? I'll still rescue my people. When he sees that their power is gone and there is none remaining bond or free, then he will say, Where are their gods now, the rock in which they took refuge, who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering? Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your protection. So you guys were putting all your hope in those idols before. Where are they? Verse 39, see now that I, even I am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Okay, now this verse can be very hard to swallow for a lot of people to hear God declare that he kills and he wounds. And most of us will either get stuck on those words or we will tend to kind of turn a blind eye to them because we can't fathom why a loving God would do such a thing. But this is kind of one of those moments where we have to just trust that He is God and we are not. We cannot box God into what we feel or think that He should be. And this is one of those crossroad verses where we are either going to say, yes, Lord, I believe in who you are and what you say is truth, or I refuse to believe in who you are and what you say as truth. So heart check, do you trust that God is who he says he is? So is he sovereign? Verse 40, for I lift up my hand to heaven and swear as I live forever. If I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries and will repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the long haired heads of the enemies. Verse 43, rejoice with him, O heavens, bow down to him, all gods, for he avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays those who hate him and he cleanses his people's land. Moses came and recited all the words of this song in the hearing of the people, he and Joshua, the son of Nun. And when Moses had finished speaking all of these words to all Israel, he said to them, take to heart all the words by which I am warning you today, that you may command them to your children, that they may be careful to do all the words of this law. For it is no empty word for you, but your very life. And by this word, you shall live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess." 
So this is not a do as I say, not as I do kind of thing. No, he is calling us to obedience first and then to teach the children. Verse 48, that very day, the Lord spoke to Moses, go up this mountain of the Abiram, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab opposite Jericho and view the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel for a possession and die on the mountain, which you go up and be gathered to your people as Aaron, your brother died in Mount Hor and was gathered to his people because you broke faith with me in the midst of the people of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. And because you did not treat me as holy in the midst of the people of Israel. So in case you are wondering again, why Moses doesn't get to go in the promised land, God is very clear about it here for you shall see the land before you, but you shall not go there into the land that I am giving to the people of Israel. Chapter 33, this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the people of Israel before his death. And I was like, wow. I mean, Moses was just told that he's going to be leaving this world, losing out on the one dream that he worked for his entire life. And yet he is able to turn around and bless the people. I mean, he didn't say peace out y'all and sail off into the sunset, which I think most of us would probably do if we were told that. So this goes against the very grain of human nature, because from the time that we are babies, I mean, if you take something from us, the natural inclination is to scream and cry about it. But that isn't the way of the Lord. Jesus tells us that when someone slaps you on one cheek, you're supposed to turn and give them the other cheek as well. Or if they take your cloak, you're supposed to give them their tunic. I mean, he's the one who kept on walking toward the cross that was about to execute him. And it's because he wanted to bless us. So heart check, when you are stripped of blessings, are you still able to turn around and bless others? So here's what he said. He's going to give individual blessings upon the tribes of Israel. Verse two, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the 10,000 of holy ones. So we believe this is the angels in attendance with flaming fire at his right hand. Yes, he loved his people. So this is his why. This is why he does what he does because he loves us. And the same reason, you know, we make our kids get in the car and buckle up, put your seatbelts on because we love you, not because we're trying to strap you down. All his holy ones were in his hands, so they followed in your steps, receiving direction from you. When Moses commanded us a law as a possession for the assembly of Jacob, thus the Lord became king in Jeshurun, when the heads of the people were gathered, all the tribes of Israel together. So let Reuben live and not die, but let his men be few. So in other words, let him go ahead and have a future, but it's not going to be a very glorious one. And this he said of Judah, Hear, O Lord, the voice of Judah, and bring him into his people. With your hands, contend for him, and be a help against his adversaries. So this is a prayer for military strength for Judah. And Levi, he said, Give to Levi your Thummim and your Urim to your godly one, whom you tested at Massa, with whom you quarreled at the waters of Meribah, who said of his father and mother, I regard them not. He disowned his brothers and ignored his children, for they observed your word and kept your covenant. They shall teach Jacob your rules and Israel your law. So in other words, they passed the test. And the Urim and the Thummim were the means by which priests would decide on certain cases or to make decisions. But ultimately, it was the Lord giving them that revelation or that answer through them. And while we do sometimes flip a coin, we all know that that's just kind of left to chance. I mean, that's not a divine decision. But we have a high priest who we can go to whenever we need an answer. But rather than seeking an audible answer from him, the scripture tells us that he is the way, meaning he is the answer. So all you need to do is simply abide in him, meaning you stay in his car on the journey of life and you will end up where you're supposed to be. But if you go hopping in someone else's taxi or Uber, you're probably going to end up somewhere you're not supposed to be. So we don't need to force anything or even leave it to some universal fate. So heart check. When you're looking for an answer or guidance, where do you look? 
So continuing here with Levi, they shall put incense before you and whole burnt offerings on your altar. Bless, O Lord, his substance and accept the work of his hands. Crush the loins of his adversaries, of those who hate him, that they rise not again. So this is asking for protection for them. Of Benjamin, he said, the beloved of the Lord dwells in safety. And remember, he's not only the beloved of the Lord, but also of Jacob. The high God surrounds him all day long and dwells between his shoulders. So this is asking for peace and safety to be upon them. And interesting, the southern area where the tribe of Benjamin did end up settling is shaped like two shoulders. And right in the middle of that is Jerusalem. So that, of course, that being his dwelling place and his holy city. Verse 13, and of Joseph, he said, which of course includes Ephraim and Manasseh, blessed by the Lord be his land with the choicest gifts of heaven above and of the deep that crowd Couches beneath with the choicest fruits of the sun and the rich yield of the months, with the finest produce of the ancient mountains and the abundance of the everlasting hills, with the best gifts of the earth and its fullness and the favor of him who dwells in the bush. May these rest on the head of Joseph, on the pate of him, which that's head again, who is prince among his brothers, a firstborn bull. He has majesty and his horns are the horns of a wild ox. So this is speaking of military prowess and victory and strength. With them, he shall gore the peoples, all of them to the ends of the earth. They are the 10,000s of Ephraim and they are the thousands of Manasseh. And remember, Ephraim is the youngest one. So clearly he is the exalted child here. And of Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in your going out, and Issachar in your tents. They shall call peoples to their mountain. There they offer right sacrifices, for they draw from the abundance of the seas and hidden treasures of the sand. So this is speaking of their safety and living by the seas and also finding joy in their daily tasks of offering their sacrifices. Now these hidden treasures I read in a commentary could possibly have meant oil. Verse 20, and of Gad, he said, blessed be he who enlarges Gad. Gad crouches like a lion. He tears off arm and scalp. So this is speaking of readiness for war. He chose the best of the land for himself, for their commander's portion was reserved. And he came with the heads of the people. With Israel, he executed the justice of the Lord and his judgments for Israel. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's club that leaps from Bashan. And of course, Dan being a very small tribe that ends up being dispersed, scattered because of hostility that they experience from the Philistines. Verse 23, and of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, sated with favor and full of the blessing of the Lord, possess the lake and the south. So they will possess the land that is west and south of the Sea of Galilee, and they will have abundant favor and contentment. And of Asher, he said, which of course, Asher means happy, most blessed of sons be Asher. Let him be the favorite of his brothers and let him dip his foot in oil. And this could be speaking of olive oil with their land being rich in blessing. Your bars shall be iron and bronze, so they'll be fortified. And as your days, so shall your strength be. There is none like God, O Jeshurun, again, that's Israel, who rides through the heavens to your help, through the skies in his majesty. So this is kind of a picture of God riding on his chariots through heaven. The eternal God is your dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he thrust out the enemy before you and said, destroy. So Israel lived in safety. Jacob lived alone in a land of grain and wine, whose heavens drop down dew. Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help and the sword of your triumph. Your enemies shall come fawning to you and you shall tread upon their backs. And I said, this is a beautiful blessing here where I feel like we can stick our own names in there. Happy are you, O Kanoi, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, because we are a people saved by the Lord, the shield of our help, right? And the sword of our triumph. Absolutely. Absolutely. Our enemies shall come fawning to us and we shall tread upon their backs in Jesus' name. So in the end, we see that these blessings are really quite different than the more judgmental blessings spoken by their father, Jacob. And if you want to go back and kind of compare, you will see that. And I mean, as parents, we tend to either be the greatest cheerleaders of our children or the hardest critics. But I love how Moses, as a spiritual father, pronounces blessings of potential. He is choosing to leave them with encouragement rather than criticism. And when you compare both of these blessings and those spoken by Jacob, 
And when you compare both these blessings and those spoken by Jacob, they are both prophetic in the way that they came to fruition. So this tells us that what we speak over the future of our own children or the next generation, it matters. Even for those who are not parents, what we say about that future generation, it matters because we are spiritual parents. And as Christians, the words we speak over people, over the church, over our communities, our workplace, they should be words that build up unless you are wanting to tear them down. So heart check. What kinds of blessings are you pronouncing? Ones of judgment or ones of encouragement? Now, before we finish off the book of Deuteronomy, we are going to jump over to Psalm 91 which is believed to have been written by Moses. Some of the words echoing the song that we just read about. So this is a Psalm of trust. Verse one, he who dwells or lives closely within in the shelter in your translation might actually say secret place. So he who dwells in the shelter of the most high will abide in the shadow of the almighty. Now most high speaks of course of God's majesty and the almighty is the name Shaddai or El Shaddai, which we know. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God, God in whom I trust. So Moses declaring his confidence in the Lord, verse three, he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. Now the snare of the fowler brings to mind images of like a hunter with a bird trap. And with the enemy wanting to trap us spiritually, of course, this brings to mind the image of Satan as well. Whereas Jesus wants us soaring on wings like eagles. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings, you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. So he is saying, there is no need to fear the evil that is around you. The stuff you're seeing on social media, the stuff you're seeing on the news, don't fear that. You can trust in Him knowing that His promises will remain true today. Verse 7 A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes. You see the recompense of the wicked. So, this is speaking of His divine protection. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. Now, if you are living with anxiety of what is going on in the world today, you need to write this one real big in your journal or on your wall, put it on a post-it note, put it on your mirror, because this is a promise that we can still hold on to. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Now, if that sounds familiar, it is because this is one of the scriptures that Satan actually used to try to tempt Jesus in the wilderness. But he kind of left out one part of that in the in all your ways. So he was like, jump off this mountain and he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. Jesus was like, in all my ways. So he wasn't about to let Satan's temptation overtake him. On their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent, you will trample underfoot. Now the lion, the adder and the serpent are all words that are often associated with Satan. So we have that authority to trample him under our feet. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So in other words, when you are saved, you will be under that promise of protection, God's presence, his power, and his provision. And with those final words of Moses being spoken, we now come to the close of Deuteronomy, I always get so emotional at this, um, chapter 34. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, all of Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, the Negeb and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. And the Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley of the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. 
Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was undimmed and his vigor unabated. So this tells us that God had control on his death. It's not like he was dying just simply of old age. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. And that was a typical time of mourning. And then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. But of course, he was never forgotten, even though the mourning was over. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Now, he was the only one who spoke face to face with the Lord, who had that intimate relationship with him. And of course, the only prophet that arose greater than him was Jesus. None like him for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, and for all the mighty power and the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all of Israel. So here we end the book of Deuteronomy, which started with a man who didn't believe in himself. You know, he would ask, who am I to do this? Yet here he faithfully delivered three powerful messages that make up this entire book. And he went from being a stuttering shepherd to the greatest prophet of his time. And yet none of it went to his head. You know, he remained humble. He was courageous. He was full of wisdom. And even though his failure may have kept him from the promise, he knew how valued he still was by the Lord. And it's the same way with us. You know, we might be shackled by something. We might be messing up all the time, or we may just feel like we are merely existing in this life. But God sees you and he values you. And it is often the ones who do question that God is going to use to the greatest degree. I mean, that was Moses. And I believe that when he got to the top of that mountain and he was looking out, yeah, he may have been sad. It would be the same way. Like if God took us to the end of our life, we're going to look on our children. We're going to look at their futures. And it's going to make us a little sad that we aren't going to be there to experience it with them. But I believe that when he was on top of that mountain, that God told him, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I think that we can't forget this because the enemy will always try to hold that one little thing that you did over your head. And he will try to always make you think that you're never going to get there. or You're never going to serve your purpose. But I am here to tell you otherwise. If you remain faithful to the end, the way that Moses did, I believe that we will still hear those words as well despite the mistakes that we have made, because when we do stand before him, he's going to take those mistakes and he's going to throw them into the fire. He's going to throw them into the sea of forgetfulness. And what will come out of the fire is the value. He will be able to physically show us what a treasured possession that we truly are. So taking a look at some of our deep dive questions. List the different traits of God that Moses describes in his song. Do you think God's judgments are fair? Does the song of Moses challenge or strengthen your faith in God? Which of the blessings can you relate to personally? How does this inspire you to apply these blessings to your life? Does the blessing upon Israel in verses 26 through 29 give you confidence? In what way? And how can you leave a legacy of blessings? So Heavenly Father, we thank you for leaving the ultimate legacy of a blessing for us. Happy are we who have been saved by the Lord. Thank you for helping us whenever we're in need and for shielding us whenever danger lurks. You are the source of victory still today. So we will choose to continue to dwell in your everlasting arms of safety. We do not need to fear despite what people say about the state of the world and what is to come. No, we set our hope on you and your promises, not the faulty words of people. And I pray that we are able to find that contentment in the abundant favor that you have given to us. If we are unable to see how blessed we really are, will you show us today so that we do not go a step further with hearts of ingratitude? And thank you, Lord, for loving us with an everlasting love. I pray that we will find freedom within the boundaries that you have set forth so that we aren't seeking a cheap thrill on the outskirts. You know, Moses had promise taken from him, but he was still so content with your presence alone that he was able to finish well with so much dignity. Help us to do the same so that we too can leave a life of legacy for others. And I pray that we will speak words of life and encouragement, not phony words of flattery, but words of truth and potential. Help us to trust you for who you are and accept every single word as true even as hard as it may be to digest. 
because you are sovereign. There is none like you. You are God and we are not, so I pray that we never try to rise above you. And will you fill us afresh today with wisdom and understanding so that we will always discern the outcome of our choices and our decisions? And may we consider the consequences before we simply jump into anything head first without thinking. Please don't ever allow us to forget you. What a lousy place it would be to be hidden from your face. So I pray that we will build ourselves on our solid rock so that we will not be moved. And we thank you for the gift of salvation that has the promise of your presence, your power, your provision, and your protection within it. I pray that we will allow you to take us to that secret place high up out of the worries of this world. We know that there we will discover a true intimacy with you, something that can't be learned in a book. And it must be experienced by full surrender. So help us to do that today. What an honor it is that we are known by you. And we thank you for the life of Moses who we feel is like a friend of ours. He's that friend that we all want around because he's just good company. May we be people like that, who carry that heart, knowing that he ultimately carries yours. And I pray that when we reach that mountaintop with you, that we too will hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. We so look forward to it. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death and every single one of us have fallen short. And then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I wanna be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna end up after I die, but I don't wanna live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer. And I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.